<laughs> okay, here we are on the 32nd show of What is Truth? My name is John Barnwell, and I'm here with Reverend David William Perry. And we're going to pursue, as always, truth. And that's a, a very evasive subject at times. And, uh, but nonetheless, we're going to give it our best shot. But today's the 32nd episode. That's like the, the 32 paths of wisdom on the tree of life. And the tree of knowledge, of course. And so that gives us a, a framework that we could dustle our, our musings and give them a context that could be relevant in the form of a riddle. How you doing there, Reverend David? Good to see you as always, John. I'm trying to find the right angle because I'm on my phone in a hotel room after our monthly service for Valentine's Hall, and no matter which direction I point this phone in, there's this sort of weird, huge, smiling face staring back at me, um, hoping I'm making some sort of sense and everyone can hear me. Yeah, it's been a, a strange but interesting week. Um, I've decided most of my Warhol material is going to actually become a novel. Um, somebody very kindly reminded me during the week that none of us are getting any younger. And if I was really, if I was really planning to take the world of literature by storm, wasn't it about time I actually did it? I'd like to say to that person, don't worry, I'm not going to mention your name. I have endless material that is unpublished so far yeah, because publishers are just publishers. Um, I, I wouldn't use a profanity on the, on, on the Sabbath, of course. Um, so, yeah, I'm OK, John. The, the temperatures are slowly improving in lockdown Britain. Um, there are rumours that things will start getting back to normal soon. I don't know. Since I don't trust a single person in the current administration, um, I'm just keeping my fingers crossed. As an old libertarian, I, I, I've always thought libertarianism belonged in the future, sadly. It's not really for now. It's for down the line a bit. And therefore, all of my political feelings and thoughts have tended to be rather abstract. This is the first time in my own biography I've actually disliked on a personal level an entire group of politicians. Um, therefore, this is new territory for me as well. Um, I, I've never come across such a self-serving group of, of tight-fisted anti-social thieves in my entire life. Um, but, you know, and, uh, tr I, th I can back up all of those comments, which is the sad thing. Boris Johnson said um, famously a couple of years ago that truth wasn't important in politics. My God, don't we all know that now? You know, so how, how am I feeling? I'm feeling OK. The sun was shining today. It's the Lord's good Sabbath. Missed my mystical conversations with you last week because we had a good old literary chinwag. But who knows where the where the, the donkey will take us on this third Sunday of Lent today. So, okay. But passing back to you. Well, good. Well, you know, I gave it some thought. And I figured, uh, in light of some of the comments that you made uh, last week, uh, regarding uh, Shakespeare and Company, that wonderful little bookstore on the banks, on the left bank in Paris, that's quite possibly going to be finding a closure, which is unfortunate because that is really the touchstone for English literature in Paris. And in many regards, that was a gateway to the world as far as American literature and uh, in Irish literature and British literature, uh, but uh, American literature and it's, it's all so far reaching that I thought, well, that would give us ample opportunity 
to kind of do our quixotic mixture of analysis and opinion. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, you caught me that time. Um, remember, I'm on my phone, so all the settings are different. Um, is it quixotic? Gosh. Um, I think it's, it's, it's Zen. It's endless Zen discourse with riddles and koans and wonderful mysticisms. Um, I can't say, along with you, how deeply saddening it is uh, for me personally, and I know for you as well, that Shakespeare and co are having such terrible troubles. Um, yeah, I mean, it, 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 in a sense, it's more than simply an outlet for different types of literature. It's a cultural, a living cultural force and an icon. Um, so many people have, have clarified their ideas there, let alone launch careers. And so many people have been put to the test in that place, not all of whom succeeded, of course. And I was thinking of my arch enemy, Michael Moorcock. Um, oh, God, that bloody man. Um, I, I wish I could just push him off the table or something. Get out of my life, Michael Moorcock. Because, you know, it's annoying swords and sorcery 80% of the time. No, I'll be generous 70% of the time. It's just annoying. But then he comes up with a gem and a masterpiece, and I'm sat there for weeks thinking, oh, God, I wish I'd written that. Oh, God, I wish I'd written that. Um, so, yeah, I, I noticed he, I mean, he's some sort of humanist, isn't he? I mean, he went there uh, to give a, a sort of overview a couple of years ago of his literary career and it had me mesmerized i confess it had me mesmerized i mean i remember when i was a, a callow cub um in the 70s where there was yet another major strike in britain um i mean do they ever make the international press where basically people only had uh, power in their houses in their homes for a couple of evenings a week and the rest you were by candlelight trying to pretend you could, you could you know, topics of conversation in common with your parents, which none of us did. Um, and I remember discovering Michael Moorcock's oeuvre at that time. I think it deserves the word oeuvre. And he had me intrigued because I managed to work out, I read some criticism on, on him years later, but I managed to work out from the start that all of his heroes, if that's the word I'm looking for, had the initials J.C., and I thought, oh, right, OK, there's something going on there. And the one that caught my particular attention was actually Jarek Carnelian, um, who was the protagonist in a trilogy, Dancers at the End of Time. And, I mean, it, it's, it's shocking, but it's not shocking. You know, does anybody, is anybody shocked by anything anymore? Um, it start, it's at the end of time. So... It starts at the end of time when there's no there's no time left. History is gone. It's over. And it begins with a sort of unsettling scenario of Jarek Carnelian having a sort of erotic, erotically charged picnic with his mother on a beach. And it begins to unpack from there. And you begin to realize after a while, hang on. It's a morality tale. So what he's done is he's written a classic morality tale um, in a society, in a human society, where anything is possible. Their science got so complicated, it became magic. And they can do anything they want. And you get to realize, as you're reading through the course of these wonderful interweaving narratives, that they are actually nice people. They're decent. They're honest. Not like the rest of humanity. You know, all the... All the rest, all the other centuries where everybody's protesting about how pure they are and about how nice they are when they're just simply not. The last last generation of people at the end of time that get up to heaven knows what are actually nice and decent. Um, so it had me, you know, things like that. It had me, he had me intrigued. And there was another one called The Golden Barge, which I felt was a clever reworking of Orlando. Um you know, sort of the, the, the uh, it's basically set in archetypal London because he goes in for all this sort of um, endless chains of worlds and string theory and all that sort of stuff. So it's on a planet Earth. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's not. 
and it's in the ultimate London, so clearly it's not this version of London, because as you unkindly remember every, uh, remember, uh, remind me every week, the city's just down the road plotting against the human race. So clearly it's not this London. And of course, the ultimate sovereign in Britain, it's not Victoria, it's Elizabeth I, you know, the fairy queen herself. So a version of her is sitting on the throne of London in this ultimate London. And you think, gosh, well, OK. And she's sad and she's quiet and she's unfulfilled. And it's I don't know, it's not the, the, the main story itself intrigues me, but it's the little vignettes, it's the little sub-narratives that suddenly appear out of nowhere. In, she's holding court in, in, one of, in one of the sort of ongoing stories and a time machine suddenly appears in the middle of the court and out gets an alchemist who says his name is Adolphus Hintler. Now that might be a clue to somebody. And on his, on his version of Earth, he's just brought the planet to rack and ruin by starting a war. And everybody was against him or he would have won. And you think, well, you know, it's clever and it's witty. But the bit that actually caught my attention, because, of course, this is the country of theatre. You know, what, what do the Germans do? They do philosophy and engineering. Maybe there's a link there. Who knows? What do the French do? They do social sciences. Uh, they, they do fashion. You know, so what do the British do? They do history and they do drama. We do history and we do drama. And it was when, when one of the courtiers is going to a theatre in this ultimate London and is reminded that the greatest actor of their day is a total recluse. I could name five great British actors now I know who are total recluses and need to go back into the closet because they can't take any more. So, but, you know, it was this little vignette where the guy disappears. I can't remember how, if he's off stage or on stage. And he's used a magical ring to go to a different astral level of their world. And the one of the protagonists is following him and, and transfers to this other world as well and meets the actor who pitches him a look of daggers and says, oh, even here I'm allowed no privacy. <laughs> so, so it's clearly London. It's clearly London with all of its machinations and going on and queenie fits and theatricals. So yeah, I'm 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 okay. Um, as I I don't know, I, my fascination with Catholic occultism, which remains firm. Somebody wants me to write a book on Catholic occultism. I'm not a Catholic in the strict sense, of course. So I don't know what I I mean about that. And I was toying with a few names that you will sadly know. Uh, people like uh, Vintras and uh, um, oh gosh, I mean, who wrote Le Bar again? Uh, Usman, Isman, um, you know, some very great and sometimes rather sinister names that they want me to write about and speak about. And I don't know, I'm, two things hold me back from that. Firstly, a lot of them are involved in the arts. And the, the minute you're dealing with an artistic personality, I'm not certain where the art ends and where the magic begins. And I'm not certain half the time what the difference is between those things anyway. Uh, although I'm, I absolutely am convinced there is a difference. Um, certainly in, in Mount Athos inside me, um, I touched upon the fact that even sacred drama, drama and even sacred drama is not worship. Um, and, you know, theatre isn't worship. Therefore, when Alex Jones sees a couple of old Hollywood hacks putting on some, you know, something allegedly dark, wearing wearing buffalo horns, I'm afraid, no, it doesn't mean it's black magic. I'm sorry, Alex. It, it means it's a poor performance that hasn't been thought through. I'm sorry. Um, so there's that going on. And I'm trying to remember the names. I mean, some of them are like Lou Tremont, although, of course, I think he was just a hurt person. I mean, the, I remember reading The Lays of Meldora many years ago. Um, it was um, Andre Breton, the very founder of the Surrealists, the, the great genius behind the Surrealists, who said he was the real father of surrealism. And I read that deeply disturbing, very dark novel. And I was glad I'd read it, but I wouldn't read it again. Um, and thinking, well, that is so dark and it's so much in the shadow. I mean, where does that end and black magic begin? Um, so, yeah, I've got those thoughts on my mind at the minute. 
Um, the world needs more light magic, more white magic. We need more Steiners. We need more. We need more John Barnwells. I don't think we need more people. And of course, there were the opposites. I mean, I'm thinking of the the people involved in uh, the Neo Rosicrucianism. The Church eventually condemned at that particular time. But I don't know. I, I maybe maybe I'll do a book on that. Maybe I don't know, John. It's just oh, these bloody Frenchies. They're all so clever. Why do they plague me? with their ingenuity and their fine food and their glorious country. Why can't they leave me alone and, and stop tantalizing me with wonderful cities and gorgeous aperitifs? Why can't they just drop it and admit they're all bastards? Apart from that, I'm fine. Well, uh, I never know what touchstone I'm going to find. Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned Rudolf Steiner, and of course, as uh, frequent listeners and viewers know, that's basically the hub of my cosmological uh, take on the universe. And it's provided in my books, of course, but we'll get around to stuff like that. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, going back to... Uh, understanding the significance of Shakespeare and company and Sylvia Beach and uh, her endeavor there that was continued on beyond her uh, by another owner. And, uh, but rather than get into all that, I want to touch on one of the figures uh, or of the circle that surrounds Shakespeare and company. And that's uh, T.S. Eliot, the American poet Poet laureate, poet laureate uh, the uh, receiver of the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, he's quite a daunting figure, and his his poems that uh, the four quartets in particular, and uh, the Wasteland, which is basically uh, his underpinnings for a ritual to romance by Jesse Weston, which is a study in grail literature, which is uh, interestingly present when they get back to find uh, Marlon Brando as, as the colonel. And there's some books sitting on the floor and it's very telling what books are there because there's a, a copy of uh, Jesse Weston's From Ritual to Romance. There's uh, uh, the edition of uh, Shakespeare's Faust. And uh, there's a, what, a Bible? And uh, I can't remember the other volume. I, I wish I had known we were going down this corridor. But anyways, let's get back to T.S. Eliot because he's very interesting. He did a radio broadcast in 1959 uh, on September 26 for uh, Nordwestdeutscher Rundfunk, which is a, a radio show. Uh, and he made a really interesting remark. He said, and I quote, I think that the present time will spontaneously lead to something like the separation of individual human beings from time's events. They will stand on their own feet and from their inmost being, they will seek new paths, spiritual paths. It seems to me that Goethe, for example, had a compass of consciousness which far surpassed that of his 19th century contemporaries. Rudolf Steiner expressly upheld this and I do too. In a certain connection, atomic science has a meaning namely in as much as it is in the hands of men who are in no way capable, able to cope with it. It has no importance whatever for the progress of mankind. I see the path of progress for modern man in his occupation with his own self, with his inner being, as indicated by Rudolf Steiner, end quote. Uh, but that kind of really establishes a strong uh, footing in, in his ability to be able to move into the future 
and uh, there's you'll see in certain writings that uh, their cast of mind is derivative from the past, largely. And uh, now I'm not passing judgment on it; it's just an observation that that's that's how they express themselves artistically, uh, and whether it be in literature, painting, or whatever. For example, the Pre-Raphaelites. They were consciously hearkening back to the painters that preceded uh, Raphael, the painter, and uh, so that they took that title upon themselves. But in, in looking at, at Eliot's remarks and looking at the circle in which he moved is, is quite fascinating because it, it really, it, there's a very small corridor when it comes to the, the higher levels of, 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 of what you might call literature and uh, high literature perhaps but uh, the really the I think the important vantage point that one can get in understanding uh, modern literature in the English language primarily you have to you have to at least touch upon Shakespeare and company because that was the hub of, of so much that was so significant in literature and uh, just to take the one uh, example, uh, James Joyce. And when James Joyce uh, went to Paris and he went to Shakespeare and Company and met Sylvia Beach, uh, it was at a time where he had worked six years on writing his major epic, Ulysses, which is basically uh, the first example or, or a, a pri not the first but a primary example of what's called modernist literature and uh, it's it's to take literature into a more modern form and and step aside from many of the archaicisms and the the back pointing uh, habits of language and it's interesting to note that because if you if you look more closely at at James Joyce and William Butler Yeats and Ernest Hemingway and there's also other people that that were under this influence William Faulkner John Steinbeck Samuel Beckett uh, Wyndham Lewis so there's a quite an epic list of these people and what is it that connects them all together and Carl Sandburg and uh, so in mentioning Carl Sandburg I'll give uh, a short quote from him that, that shows you uh, this, 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 the radiating spokes from the hub of Shakespeare and Company. And Sandberg says in his uh, poetry, he says, all talk on modern poetry by people who know ends with dragging in Ezra Pound somewhere. It may be named only to be cursed as wanton and mocker poser, trifler, and vagrant. Or he may be classed as filling a niche today like that of Keats in a preceding epic. The point is, he will be mentioned, end quote. And so there you have it, the, the daunting figure of the inscrutable Ezra Pound, who's, who's troubling on more than one level, but nobody can escape the brilliance of, of his own work uh, given that they even have the aptitude to even deal with it. And then uh, to look at his influence and, and the people that he edited, there's a whole list of, of them uh, that I mentioned earlier, William Butler Yeats, T.S. Eliot, Ernest Hemingway, and others who, after he edited their works, received the Nobel Prize for Literature. And so he was able to with his editorial strokes, bring them into the modern era and bring them the, what's considered the highest accolade in literature among many people. And so that's, that's, that's fascinating right there because he uh, never received it even though there's some, what I think five or six people that he edited that received the Nobel Prize for literature after he edited their work. So that's, you got to go. Well, what is that? And it really it it spins around a problem because see, uh, 
uh, Ezra Pound was put in a mental institution for some 14, 15 years by the U.S. government without trial yeah. because the radio broadcast that he did in support of Mussolini. And, but it, if, you, if you really look underneath the hood of, of, of what he's talking about, it, it becomes really interesting. First of all, he became really uh, insanely uh, anti-Semitic, which is unfortunate, because it's largely due to his being unable to be able to discriminate between uh, Jewish uh, people, real Jews, and the Sabbateans. And the, the complaints that he had against Judaism, they're the ones that can be pointed at the, the Sabbateans and their movement within Germany, the, the labor Zionists and, and, and the, the roots of, of uh, the banker system. Because see, he was, he was a, a near genius when it came to understanding the banking system. And it was due to his uh, research that was carried on by Eustace Mullins at the Library of Congress that we have the information we have today about the Federal Reserve banking system in the United States that's chartered under the, the Bank of England and uh, was carried about by members of Sabbatean Frankist uh, families like the Rothschilds and their associates in America, the Rockefellers. And so that's what he was against. And uh, so, but you weren't allowed to have that opinion at that time. And uh, unfortunately, like I said, he couldn't discriminate between the Sabbateans and, and the Jewish people. Uh, it was the same uh, fairly recently with David Icke. He, he didn't make that distinction, but he finally came to understand it. And so his more recent podcasts have, have uh, expressed this distinction, uh, like the ones we received this morning in our email from our friend Lowell Gallen in Jerusalem. Hi, Lowell. And so it's difficult to look at these things with discrimination because you know, people always want to simplify the task. They always want closure and they go, aha, this is, this is the answer. And, and they think they figured it all out and they've just found a piece of the puzzle that will require f further discrimination. For example, accusing Catholics of, of the machinations of the Jesuits. That's a, a clear distinction. And then you look here in America and, and, you, and you go, what just happened? I mean, all of a sudden, uh, the most powerful people in America are all Catholic and a Jesuit trained, and, and you know, it's just, they're pretty slippery. You know, they, they managed to get into the, the, the ring, grab that ring of power, one ring to rule them all. <clears throat> I, I seem, to, seem to remember that it was a misunderstanding or not a misunderstanding about the Lord of the Rings that brought the pew to an end. Um, so, oh, Lord, um, where do I begin with all that? T.S. Eliot, uh, a remarkable poetic genius who many people, including myself, thinks brought poetry into the 20th century. Um, uh, uh, an American who converted to Anglicanism, of course. I've actually been to the church where he served as, a, oh, was it a deacon or a church warden? I can't remember which is hidden uh, around the sort of uh, old Covent Garden area. I don't know what the, the minister there thought of him, but, you know, hey, it's T.S. Eliot, you know, show some respect. Um, now a remarkable poet looking for sacramental realities that maybe had lost that type of configuration. I'm not saying there are no sacramental realities. I am saying our understanding of them differs in different epochs in different centuries in different frames of reference and if, if it that wasn't the case then they're not real at all if, if that isn't happening then they're not real at all since sacramental mysteries are real yes they take different configurations in different time frames because they're real 
Um, oh, you mentioned him. Yeah, I, I was always more drawn to Herman Hesse, uh, to be honest. That was the first guy I cut my serious literary teeth on, which is why I'm a gummy bear these days and I have no teeth left. Um, a very, very profound, serious, true author, you know, the classic author in, 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 in speech marks and underlined three times, um, a friend of Carl Jung and a, a member of the League of Eastern Wayfarers, of course. They'd go on pilgrimage together and stay uh, between churches and pray at all the churches they went to en route. Something deeply mystical and psychoanalytical at the same time, who also won the Nobel Prize, I think, the glass bead game. I love his short stories, though. I love Damien, which has nothing to do with the movie. I loved... <laughs> Just in case anybody's worried, I love Sid Harter. Yes, that is to do with book. Beautiful and a masterpiece at the same time. Um, I like Ulysses. I could slap Stephen Daedalus around the face. Get a grip, man. You know, I mean, oh, it's all to do with love, really? Yeah, but sort of some of us knew that in the first place. I think, nevertheless, it, it's an incredible book. You know, I think people fall into one of two camps with, with Joyce, and particularly with Ulysses. Either you love the experimentalism or you think it's pretentious. If you think it's pretentious, you know nothing about literature. End of period. You know, because... But it, 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 these wonderful experimentations with language. It, it, a novel isn't just about telling a story. It can be many things. It can be, uh, um, it can be linguistics. It can be philosophy. It can be a dream. It can be science. A novel's many things. It can be psychology. In that particular case, it's a series of experiments with language around the myth of Daedalus and Icarus, which, of course, is, is, is beautiful. Um, oh, gosh. We ended up talking about a number of other things. Now, I'll hand back to you for a minute, John, because I don't want to implicate myself beyond a certain point. I'll just say just say one thing. The great bookshops have been on my mind this week because, of course, Lawrence Ferenghetti passed at a reasonable age as well. Um, but I'm, I'm beginning to realise what an absolute time bomb uh, that man actually was. I mean, I... I was sort of a, a, a deeply influenced by the beatniks. I still am, I suppose. Um, you know, I, I think people forget that to be a beat meant you were you were thrown into you know, into be into a beatified state. You were thrust into divine glory, and the fact they're always going on about Zen and jazz and Mexico being this sort of mythical promised land. I mean, there's so very much of that material, and without Vernon Getty, of course, none of them would have been published. And, you, you know, Allen Ginsberg wouldn't have got his Nobel Prize. The the end. Um, no, I, there's magic in books, bookmen and texts and materials. And I think that it's a shame that this society doesn't read at the minute. So that's a global phenomena. And I suspect it's one being manipulated by very dark powers indeed that don't want comparative thinking to actually take place. I will hand back to you before I do implicate myself. I might have something sterling to say in a minute, but I'm trying to make sure it won't get me lynched. Passing back to you, John. <laughs> that being said, I hope your phone is plugged in so your battery doesn't die and you just disappear like I've had happen on other <laughs> podcasts. I'm talking to somebody, all of a sudden they're gone. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the beatniks. Well, you know, and in getting into understanding uh, Shakespeare and company and and their relationship to uh, that that whole movement that that we discussed last week, it, it's like uh, really important to to make a distinction because. The bookstore was founded in 1919 on the left bank of Paris by a woman named Sylvia Beach, who's uh, from New Jersey. Now, there was a store open back in 1951 by a guy named George Whitman, also on the left bank, but under a different name. And uh, But he adopted the, the Shakespeare and Company uh, name for his store in 1965. 
and uh, was with the blessing of, of Sylvia Beach herself. And but you see that that's that shift because see, he was a socialist, and uh, he he was kind of a, a utopian socialist, and really there was a lot of good endeavors that centered around that store because uh, artists and, and writers could could come there and they could they had all these they have all these beds there and you could actually stay there while you're working because when when somebody's writing their the great American novel or, or the, their epic poem, whatever, uh, it's hard to be able to find a space in which the creative work could take place. And so during uh, the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, people would find sponsors within the nobility, what have you, to be able to to support them while they, they did their creative work. This is a long-standing tradition going back to some of the earliest uh, Grail literature and before. And uh, you can look at a more recent example of uh, uh, Ranier uh, Maria Rilke, for example, on the shores of the Adriatic at the Castle Duino, writing his Duino elegies and uh, sonnets to Orpheus. It's because of, of that uh, sponsorship that he was able to get into that concentrated frame of reference to be able to create such dynamic work. And so uh, you have to look at that Sylvia Beach as being that kind of an influence. And she would give book launchings there. I remember a story, reading a story about uh, James Joyce because she published the his book was banned in in uh, England and the U.S. The uh, uh, Ulysses, and and he was really disturbed because it took him six years to write, and he couldn't get it published. It was banned, and uh, but she ended up publishing it through her bookstore back in 1922, and he came he came there and he did uh, a presentation there. He did numerous presentations there, but the the one that comes to mind is a story I read about where he's there and he's carrying on a conversation with everybody in the room. And there's people there from all over Europe, from Northeast, South, and West of Europe. And everybody's asking him questions in their native tongue. And he's responding to them in their native tongue. And then everybody's translating and cross-translating. What did he say? What did he say? <laughs> and because he was uh, polylingual, he could, uh, he was capable of, of reading and conversing in most European languages. I mean, this guy was an astounding figure. He probably deserves to be grouped with our, our triumvirate of uh, uh, Goethe, Swedenborg, and John Stuart Mill, as far as his, his intellectual capacity is concerned. But it's interesting because if you get into like uh, Ulysses, and it's a book that's, that's timeless in more than one respect because it's the events that happen in one day. And yet the book is huge. It's a huge book. It's the most famous book that nobody ever reads because it's, it's a difficult read. But in there, in chapter nine, it's, it, I find quite fascinating because he goes through and uh, starts naming off, uh, it, there's this whole conversation taking place and it involves uh, people discussing Hamlet and Shakespeare. And that's a touchstone again for Shakespeare and company. But in there, he mentions, uh, some, some interesting characters, one of which was a very close associate of Rudolf Steiner's, uh, D.N. Dunlap, a wonderful biography by T.H. Meyer of D.N. Dunlap. And Dunlap was the, the theosophist who uh, ended up becoming the perhaps the leading representative of Rudolf Steiner's work in, in uh, England and Ireland, the whole UK. UK, as it's now called. And he was a, a very, very dynamic, interesting fellow who 
started the, the, the World Energy Conference, where he was the one who brought about the standardization of electrical mechanisms so that there could be international uh, use of electricity and you wouldn't have to have different devices for every country you went to. Of course, the only ones that really didn't go along with that entirely were the British. They still have those clunky old electrical plugs. But in any event, he's a fascinating character. He mentions William Kwan Judge. He mentions Blavatsky. He mentions William Butler Yeats. He mentions uh, George Russell, A.E., that uh, mystical poet. Uh, all uh, prominent figures, uh, Singe, uh, all these prominent figures, uh, Isabel Cooper Oakley. I mean, it's quite remarkable how many people that, that he mentions in this and, and showing that he's familiar with the material, but yet he's has that kind of uh, uh, intellectual approach to it so that he doesn't fully appreciate it, uh, which is, it's interesting. It's a complex, uh, a very textured thing, but Nonetheless, he does state in there that uh, Goethe was, was, uh, appear, appeared to be almost always right. And so that's, that's intriguing, too. So you have this multifaceted individual who was Jesuit trained, by the way, and uh, as were very many in Ireland. And so there's a, a level of complexity that that's, it's too easy to get in, into a dismissive mode and just say oh he's one of those like what they do to pound it's pound is taboo in many universities you just can't really bring him up and it's really kind of silly but uh if you want to get at at understanding truth you have to be able to read authors you don't agree with and that's that's a, a primary thing and, and uh it's to their credit, Yale University, uh, uh, that they gave the Bollingen Prize to Ezra Pound in spite of uh, his irascible personality and uh, his peculiarities and his, his real problems with Mussolini and his uh, anti-Jewish rhetoric at times. So it's, it, it's interesting to me, you know, I mean, I've run into people, I, I, I know of a woman who, who actually is, is a scholar in, in uh, medieval uh, poetry of uh, the troubadours and the trouviers and all of that. And, and you see people like that that are interested in him. Why? Well, because Ezra Pound was the, perhaps the leading scholar of those areas at that time, that this is a guy who who was an encyclopedia of the complete tradition of uh, poetry. He could read Provençal languages. He could read, you know, uh, other other Latin and Greek. And he was he was so prolific in in his production, but in such a concentrated form that it's difficult for most people to read, and they don't ca catch the allusions that he makes. He'll, he'll refer to a literary work uh, and, and they don't catch it because they've never heard of that. Uh, I mean, the, you know, there's a, there's a reference to uh, Marie Corelli, for example, in that same chapter, but not by name. He just runs off the title of one of her books. You know, she's a, a very famous uh, uh, mystical author, you know, and uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting that you'll see this, this kind of, uh, it's like a blender almost what's going on at Shakespeare and company. All these, all these minglings coming together, but it, it was through the second owner of the store that, that it became connected with uh, the impulses of socialism, because that was not what was really going on there, but it was this kind of benevolent socialism, like I said, uh, and, and, in thinking that you could take that benevolent socialism where you're providing a space for artists to be creative and then think that you can actually create some government that's going to be able to be benevolent in the same regard <laughs> as another matter altogether. Hence Boris Johnson and his morphing into a statist.
Oh, yeah. you're determined to wave a red rag to a bull today. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Boris used to describe himself as a libertarian. You must have no education at all if you think Boris Johnson is a libertarian. Um, and I have no truck as a libertarian with people who worship the state. As Nietzsche said, the state is a lie. Is that 25, chapter 25 or 26 in Thus Speaks Zarathustra? I don't know and I don't care because he was right. The state is a lie. Um, my trouble with socialism as a word is it means so many different things in so many different places. <clears throat> and certainly in Britain, if you think of those wonderful Victorian socialists that basically thought if everybody sat down and had a cup of tea, the world will be a better place. You know, I mean, that's just sweet. I mean, it's totally unrealistic, but it's just sweet. You know, let's give the poor working classes a cup of tea. Everything will be fine. Um, no, I sort of like early types of British socialism because it was idealistic and it really was thirsting after social justice. My trouble with it is that it was bound not to work because they were dealing with a hierarchy that would have subverted it in every way possible and used it as a means of control. Um, therefore, they were pretty beautiful, lovely people out of their depth in the world of real politics. And that's probably why a lot of them were artists, writers or artisans. You know, um, even Gandhi ran into trouble after all when he started trying to put his ideals into practice. So I think you're looking... You're looking at a similar thing there. I'm, I'm going to implicate myself and say something dangerous. I've decided to, I can't hold back. I mean, I actually wrote an article on Ezra Pound a couple of years ago for E-International Relations. I can't remember the title of hand because I'm punch drunk after the service, uh, our service of worship, as is right and proper for a minister. If you're not punch drunk after a service, you haven't done it properly. Um, and I, <clears throat> my reading of Ezra Pound I, I suppose it's singular in one way, but it fits the evidence. You know, you're looking at a crushed idealist, um, a man that did believe in hierarchies in the, uh, of, of the sort I don't believe in, but he did believe them in a very positive sense. He did believe the world could become a better place, and every single step of his poetic journey was either thwarted or crushed um, until he thinks he's fighting a rear guard action and then is used at first. <clears throat> I think he's trapped after a while, but he's used at first by people who are aware he's disoriented and he doesn't really again know the reality of real politic um, and ends up in a position whereby you can't really pull back. Um, there's a tragedy to the story of Ezra Pound with a capital T. Um you know what, Ezra Pound? What what you should what shouldn't have you have done? You shouldn't have gone to Mussolini. The end. Don't go to Mussolini. Don't agree with what he says. They were, but you know that that happened. And then I get the impression all sorts of coercion and threats were used, which is why he ends up saying things I don't believe he he meant, and I don't believe he actually thought. I'm not saying he's guiltless. I am saying at that stage you're looking at someone spiraling down psychologically. And being manipulated at the same time. I, it, it, it's a terrible tale. The American forces, with deep respect to your good self and my beloved America, I believe people now know I have a love-hate relationship with America. I love America and it hates me. So I believe, if, give me a green card and everything will be fine. Let me move over there and everything will be fine. You know, um, so... You know, the American forces didn't really do the right thing when they finally got him. I mean, they put him outside. Was it for two weeks in an open cage to make him crack? Um, and of course, he actually did have a breakdown. Surprise, surprise, because they knew what they were doing. And then serious mental disorder begins to set in. So this is the end of a tragic process whereby a very a hugely talented, ingenious brilliant poet is brought down to the lowest possible denominator and tantamount to destroyed. And when he was asked about his poetry, I think it was Allen Ginsberg that asked him about his poetry saying all the beats were inspired by it later on in life. 
uh, it was actually Pound that said it's all it's all dross, it's all worthless, and don't read it because that's what had been done to him. So that is a, a terrible story. The poetry is brilliant, and the early part of his life shines like a star, and it inspired a great deal of worthy world literature, a lot of which was American. Um, oh, I, I I don't go for racial links to evil. I mean, certainly Leo's got me intrigued with these Sabbatean people. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Is there any group in the world that's so cohesive and coherent they can manage to dominate the planet? I don't know. Maybe yes, maybe no. I sadly tend to have a much darker opinion, which isn't like me. Um, surely we're looking at sin, good old-fashioned sin. It's the human predicament itself as the way it finds itself in this dispensation. Um, people aren't given naturally to goodwill, and that is the terrible tragedy of it. Um, I don't believe it will always be that way. I certainly believe in better worlds and evolution, and I, uh, there are so many wonderful people that never get heard or get downtrodden or get ignored or pushed to the side. But certainly they're not the ones with the loud voices at the moment. I like what Lowell was saying more about this. What was it? Erev Rav. Is that what? I can't remember the, the phrase. Was that it? Um, I, that, that makes a lot more sense to me than these sinister Sabbateans, to be honest. Um, for the simple reason, they seem to be nearly all powerful. Surely that can't be the case. Whereas, you know, the, I can understand a, a vociferous and um, potent minority doing their best to undermine the good and the true. That I can understand. And you're looking at old fashioned sin. Um, and therefore, it's not just the Jews. The Erev Rav is, you know, you are a member of that if you are trying to do those things and you don't value goodwill and you don't try and seek the goodwill. You don't try and seek what is good. Therefore, that that for me, when it was Roseanne and when Roseanne and Lowell started talking about that, that made total sense. That made total sense to me. Um, and also, we've got to be careful of not of lambasting people with words that change in meaning. I mean, for me, every single word is sort of like a bunch of grapes. You know, each grape is an individual meaning of the word. I mean, in, in linguistics, I think they're called conceptual clusters. A word isn't one thing. It's many things. So. I mean, there are modernists in Irish literature. There are traditionalists in Irish literature. W.B. Yeats is a, a master poet of great elegance and beauty. But we mustn't forget he started the Irish Fascist Party um, and was proud to have done so. He was one of the leading lights and one of the founders. Um, does that mean mysticism is always linked with right wing ideology? No, it doesn't. Does it mean everybody who's into magic is a Nazi? No, it doesn't. It means life is complicated and it means we have to be careful of what the words mean. I suspect if you put WBH in a room with Mussolini, they actually wouldn't have much in common, you know, because one really is a fascist and the other one is a lovely human being being wonderful. So we've got to, you know, we've got to be quite careful about what we think we mean, particularly in the hysteria of modern times. I noticed Disney has not only come out against the Muppets. If they want trouble, Disney, you know where to find it. I'm willing to I'm willing to fight you in the street. How dare you attack the Muppets? Um, for the simple reason I identify so well with Kermit the Frog, the desperate impresario just trying to get the show to go on. When everything is against him, none of the stars will turn up, all they're being divas, the minor acts are missing, everybody's late off stage, or they're going on too early. Kermit the Frog is a brother in arms. I, I understand him completely. So uh, if they're against Kermit, they're against me too, and they've got trouble. But it wasn't really that one that got me during the week. I think high literature is relatively safe until they start book burning, which at this rate is just down the road a bit, sadly. Um, but they've gone against Dr. Seuss. Um, you know, I, you know, is the cat in the hat really racist? Or is that just a ridiculous oxymoron, you know, spread by people who don't have an education at all? 
I mean, I, yeah, there were some stories I could do without. I mean, I love the Lorax. You know, I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I mean, it was some sort of ferret, wasn't it? Or some sort of hamster. So I quite, the, I quite like the fact the ultimate eco-warrior is some sort of minor rodent. I think that's good. And, of course, at the end of the story, he picks himself up by his own ass and disappears into the sky. That is an exit. That is an exit worthy of worthy of titanic and classic literature that is an exit but you know if you're looking at thing one and thing two which somebody told me a couple of years ago rather censoriously was almost like quantum mechanics you must be joking we're talking about the cat in the hat you know but but point taken there's a bit of imagination to it so i don't know i, I the world of literature itself is under assault at the minute which i find a little odd books are under assault in a way they haven't been for a long time, and am I thinking of Berlin in the nineteen late nineteen twenties and thirties? Yes, I am. I'm thinking of that. But you know, it, it's it's all the people you don't suspect. I mean, there's a group in this country. Do I do I name them by name? They had a go at me a couple of years ago. Yes, I'll say it because it's all on, on the public domain. Hope not hate can kiss my ass, and that said, wearing the collar. There we are. Um, I was holding a show at the time called the Free Speech Club, which met every month to let people of all sorts give their five penneth worth. So, the, you know, hope not hate decided to attack a free speech club. You're joking. Um, and then, you know, so and they owe me an apology. They, they wrote some nasty things. I, I think I'm named in the state of hate for one year. I don't see myself as a particularly hateful person. I do see myself as a person crippled with arthritis and can get moody, but I don't really see myself as a hateful person. And also that was a bit tart because I invited them to come and speak. Give your five penneth worth. What's wrong with you? Anyway, I think my name was mentioned somewhere. Um, and I wrote them as a series of furious emails. How dare you say that? Um, you know, I'll get a lawyer. And they they made they eventually answered with some mealy mouthed email back. You know, oh, we know you don't believe in those things. What things? We know you don't believe in those things. And, and so we, we want we're not removing it. Oh no, you know, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. We're not going to remove your name, but we'll issue a caveat. We'll insert a caveat saying we know david perry doesn't believe in those things well point one you said you'd never attack ministers of religion and point two i doubt if you did it and i've not checked because i've no faith in you um so oh no the world's topsy-turvy everything's upside down johnny rotten of the sex pistols not a group i tend to empathize with a great deal uh, what was it, Lyndon, Lyndon Lyndon, said a couple of years ago he never thought he'd live to see the day when the right wing became the main weapon of freedom and common sense. And he's got me agreeing. Oh, my God, how did that happen? You know, the old libertarian, where, where I don't know what American libertarians are like. I know the Canadian libertarians are doing a great job. I don't know what Americans are doing. It, it seems to me an American libertarian, it, libertarianism is an excuse for talking about business. But certainly in Britain, it's half dead in the water. I wish it wasn't because it's a good philosophy. I mean, it's the old Whigs, the Whig Party that originally stood up to the knobs saying, no, you can't have everything your way. Sorry, my lord, but no, which nobody had ever said before. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've got a good pedigree. We need to come back. And, of course, we were champions of literature. You don't get a John Locke without the libertarians. Um, yeah, I think literature itself is under attack. Because it's name calling and childish. And I really wonder if there wouldn't be people on hunger strike or, you know, sieging city lights nowadays if it was doing anything on a comparable level. Of course, we do need bookshops to work on that comparable level. As you were speaking a minute ago, I was trying to think is there anything in Britain that works along that basis? I mean, hardly any. I mean, my, my trouble. My trouble with this country, there are so many. If we've got a spare couple of weeks and a show that will last 10 hours, I'll start enumerating what I find troublesome in Britain. Uh, the nearest one, I think, is Watkins Bookshop, which I'm rather fond of. Um, and a dear friend of mine, <coughs> excuse me, Anthony Peake, who did a, t a very skilled man, very intelligent man, a very good writer, um, gave a talk recently on a book that's coming up on, on you know, cheating the ferryman. And he's quite an expert 
on Philip K. Dick as well. I'd love to, to get him to speak more about that because I admire Philip K. Dick as a writer. Um, anyone that thinks science fiction has nothing to say in terms of literature knows nothing about modernist literature. And modernist literature, as I said last week, I fessed up, I made my confession. Forgive me, Father Barnwell, I have sinned. Yes, I actually confess to being a radical traditionalist of some sort or other. I've no idea what that means. Apart from the fact I like a bit of traditional, I like a bit of the radical. There we are. Um, yeah, I mean, modernism is based on the premise that different epochs, or as Swedenborg would have said, different churches. For him, a church was a, a type of consciousness. Um, each epoch was a church that embodied a type of consciousness. Modernism is the church of this particular, there's an irony there somewhere, which he might have meant deliberately, um, is the church of this particular time. Modernism is the outgoing idea, the very embraceive idea, the embracing idea that the world can be a better place and we can use our brains and our reason to solve a few of the problems of the world. I mean, it gets arrogant, hubris. It suffers from hubris as the only sin the gods punish in this life, of course. You know, by thinking it can do better than the gods, which is hubris in a, on a classic level. Um, and therefore, I mean, it took them ages to realise with that attitude they destroy the ecosystem, which, of course, we're on the verge of doing now. But modernism in itself is an optimistic idea based around the fact we don't have to be wallowing in mud all our lives and can actually make beautiful, sensible things in our lives better if we all try and collaborate. What Wouldn't it be terrible if we all tried to help each other out and, and did the best thing by each other? My God, wouldn't that be make the world a terrible place? You know, some of us think modernism isn't the be-all and end-all, but it certainly has a place in literature and philosophical discourse. Uh, someone called me rather uncharitably a couple of years ago, a postmodernist. Um, I'm assuming they were, I'm not going to say that name because that will get me into trouble. I'm assuming, uh, uh, I wrote also an article on Machiavelli who is deeply misunderstood. Um, I, I was told American universities uh, to, a, to a man or a woman painted him as a total cad. Actually, he's a much more complicated character than that. And uh, I was trying to stage Mandragola, the play, um, but dip, never got the resources to do that. I think that needs restaging. Um, I was trying to talk about him and myth with a capital M and looking at the writers who did that, uh, some of who did it very subtly very subtly and particularly in Irish literature, by the way. Um, but, you know, postmodernists strike me as more acceptable to the enemies of modernism. I don't think this person realised I, I was a minister. Um, you know, let's give an image. I mean, my trouble with the, the, the postmodernists is they, they've read all the right books and they know all the best wines. And if you invite them to a party, they come round and they're perfect dinner, dinner guests. But the trouble is they leave the back door open and Nietzsche comes through and burns the house down. So, you know, I mean, that, that's my trouble with postmodernism. I and mean, it's all so bloody posh. And yeah, oh, darling, didn't you read? Do you? And then you, it goes on and on and on with these, and like you and that bloody philosophical if A then B nonsense. You know, I mean, it, it's all so wonderful. It's all so sophisticated, but nobody's any the wiser at the end of it. And we're all still facing the grim, the same grim realities that we were facing in the first place. So, yeah, I mean, I think maybe we need to be careful of the Pope the, to defend the people we read. And if it begins with an attack on popular populist culture, very soon it will attack serious culture. Uh, there's no such thing as highbrow and lowbrow. There is such a thing as people that want to talk about serious subjects and people who don't. And that's fine. Entertainment, we all need to relax. We all need some fun. That's absolutely great. But it doesn't mean people should not talk about the serious issues of life and death. They should. And you can't help feeling there are certain people in certain quarters that want to shut that type of discourse down. Therefore, attacks upon Ezra Pound, with the deepest respect to Leo, because I don't know, a simplification of saying this group is behind most of the world's woes 
makes me I think that came across on the pew because I'm, you know, I'm open to debate. If they're all bastards, let's round them up and put them in prison. But, you know, is it the human condition that we're all falling in a state of sin and perhaps these people are better at it than others? Um, now, we've got to be careful what aspersions we're casting and we've got to be careful, to, to my mind, to let other voices speak. If there's an Erev Rav in the, in the house or there's one of these Sabbateans, let's see what they've got to say because I bet they can beaten in open and fair discourse, in an open and uh, fair-minded argument, I bet they can be beaten, which is why it doesn't happen. I'm against all this polarisation where discourse never takes place. Wars end up starting, lots of people end up dead, and you're still facing the same issues afterwards. Uh, make love, not war. That's what I say. You know, the... Uh, all you need is love to date me as an old hippie again. And I'm handing back to you, John. I said my inflammatory thing. I hope your switchboard is lighting up um, because we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful of it, to my mind, a type of toxic dualism, which is now beginning to infest every single branch of, of culture and discourse, cultural discourses in themselves. And it's worrying me to the hilt. I'll hand back. Well, you cover a lot of ground as usual. Getting back to what you were referring to with, with Leo, our dear friend Leo Zagami and his poignant remarks regarding the Jesuits. I, I perhaps put a footnote on that and uh, provide you with a, a statement that Rudolf Steiner made back in 1920. He says, and I quote, it is a fundamental point of the Jesuit rule to render absolute obedience to the Pope. Now, in the 18th century, there lived a Pope who suppressed the Jesuit order irrevocably for all eternity, literally for all eternity. If the Jesuits had remained true to their own rule, they would, of course, never have appeared on the scene again. However, they did not disappear, but took refuge in countries where there were rulers at that time less favorable to Rome. Rulers who thought that by serving Jesuitism, they could serve the future, not of humanity, but of themselves and their successors. For the Jesuit order was saved by two rulers, Frederick II of Prussia and Catherine of Russia. In Roman Catholic countries, the Jesuit order was not recognized as having a valid existence. The Jesuits today owe it to Frederick II of Prussia and Catherine of Russia that they were able to survive that period when they were persecuted by Rome. I am not making polemics. I am merely stating historic facts, end quote. So there you have a very succinct point is that if they believe in, in following the Pope, then they shouldn't have reinstituted themselves and now that now the pope is a jesuit so uh i mean I, the story goes on and on i mean i was going to get into uh charles sinique and his he was uh, a interesting canadian priest who converted out of uh rome because of the the machinations of, of the jesuits and he was uh, actually uh he was served a lawsuit when he was in Illinois, uh, and he hired an attorney, and that attorney happened to be Abraham Lincoln. And uh, they became friends, and it was uh, Senequi that actually came and warned uh, Abraham Lincoln while he was president of uh, their involvement in the Civil War and of their their intentions to have him assassinated of course we know he was assassinated and but you know people argue well that was the knights of the golden circle and they were not catholic well that isn't the jesuits don't always work in the obvious way and uh for example uh there were accusations that that happened at that time that accused uh uh, Abraham Lincoln of being a secret Catholic, which would trigger 
anti-Catholic forces against Abraham Lincoln. And so it's, yes, as you say, it's the story, the actual story is always way more complicated than anybody would uh, want to uh, come to very easily. You really have to struggle to try and get behind things and figure out what's really moving. And uh, perhaps we can uh, deal with that subject. That's a whole nother subject, and I don't think we can do it credit uh, in this humble offering today. Uh, it's probably a good time to let you know that uh, we're lucky to have Reverend David William Perry here, the author of The Grammar of Witchcraft, a Shakespearean study, not a study of witchcraft, and Caliban's Redemption, his Shakespearean esque poetry, and his masterwork, Mount Athos Inside Me Essays on Religion, Swedenborg, and the Arts, edited by the talented Daniela Irendust. And these are all available on Amazon. And my books, of course, my first book is 640 pages. Uh, uh, the Arcana of the Grail Angel, the Spiritual Science of the Holy Blood and of the Holy Grail, a study developed out of the work of Rudolf Steiner, of the underground streams of esoteric Christianity, which flowed from the Brotherhood of the Holy Grail to the Order of the Knights Templar and the true Rosicrucian Order, and the sequel, the Arcana of Light on the Path, and included in them is this many cosmological diagrams that will help you understand many of the things that are discussed in these lively conversations. And uh, my books are available on eBay, although I, I have noticed that they've disabled links to uh, eBay on Facebook and on YouTube, uh, at least from me. I, someone last week says that the links were working for them. So I don't know, you might have to just go down below the posting on, uh, on uh, I mean, YouTube, uh, on YouTube or on Facebook and copy the link to get to it. Or you could just go to eBay and put in my name and Arcana and that'll be. <coughs> But anyways, excuse me for a second. Oh, John is coughing and I, I'm coughing. Um, oh, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, I'll tell you that the, the author, I, I, God, have I spent so much time reading so-called bad is it's interesting. Um, I, I remember when I started reading Jean Genet, um, who, of course, is the author David, who is the author David is talking about in the song Jean Genie, where he's actually comparing Jean Genet to a genie in a bottle once you let him out. In other words, once you've read the book, he won't go back in. He won't leave you alone. And I remember Jean-Paul Sartre, well, not literally, um, wrote when he was in jail. I mean, Genet was not a laudable person. He was a genius when it came to literature, but not a laudable person. Um <laughs> I mean, but you know, it, it, I'm trying to avoid anecdotes, but I think I've got to give one. Um, when he became famous, society ladies, you know, high place society women used to invite him to their soirees in the hope that he'd steal something, so that he could say, "Oh my God, Monsieur Genet has stolen something." You know, so um, yeah, I mean, and he tried to bore his readers to death. He actually says it in one of his books. You know, this was an attempt to bore his readers to death. But, I mean, they're so accomplished, but they're very dark. Um, and it, without that, it wouldn't have led me to my, one of my huge true heroes, I mean, Gabriel Marcel. Um, I read all the existentialists, and I'm very, very pleased I did so. They're very good at analytics. They're really, really bad at suggesting what happens next, but they are good at the analytics. Uh, one or two of them rise to the challenge. I mean, certainly... Jeanne was a friend of Jean-Paul Sartre, as they say in Paris, not Sartre, Sartre. That must be showing off if any of the annoying Frenchies are listening. Um, and also then eventually Gabriel Marcel turned up as the opposite, I suppose, to Jeanne. Um, because you have a, a, a avowedly Christian existentialist and a playwright who's trying to 
look at the problems, the philosophical problems that Genet represents. I mean, he was listening, uh, he read the same papers that I did, you know, Madame Flaxenberg or whatever, you know, wanted Monsieur Genet to steal something. So he wrote a play where you have a thief invited to a soiree, and it's actually the master of the house, the man of the house, that says to his wife after the soiree, are you really certain that's what you want to happen? Are you really certain that that is a moral, a, a goal, a, a, an ethic, a principle for anybody? And what would it mean? What if he did steal something? What if he doesn't steal something? Doesn't that say something more about you than the situation and the, you know, and the uh, antagonist of that particular play? Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, you've got me thinking about so many authors I haven't talked about for years at the minute. I love Burroughs. I love uh, Cities of the Red Knight is a masterpiece. You really have to question why that I that both Janae and Burroughs weren't given the Nobel Prize because both of them clearly deserved it. Um, was it the gay issue, LGBT? I do hope not, but I suspect so. Um, Burroughs for me, old bull Lee, of, of course, as he's known in the Beatnik books. Um, where he that was his pseudonym, wasn't it? For him as a crime writer, um, I can't read the crime books, I'm sorry. Um, I read Junkie, I read Queer, and I was thinking afterwards, they're insightful, they're clever, it's more like sociology. Um, and then all, all of a sudden, Cities of the Red Knight comes along, this dark, resplendent masterpiece on many different levels of existence, on astral levels, etheric levels in different time frames, documenting the descent of America into paranoia as he saw that. Um, these are people that need defending. I mean, you know, is it, I suppose it's where I'm MCC. I mean, an MCC Oasis minister has leeway, or maybe they don't, or perhaps they're just more inquisitive to, to look at these things than others. I'm quite proud of the fact I read these challenging texts, and it gets back to the point you said earlier, um, if we only read the people we agree with, then we really haven't learned much. And I can think of people, atheists, that I have read that have got me really concerned about a particular topic or issue. Then I resolve it to my own understanding and think, my heavens, without that challenge, without the gauntlet being thrown down, I wouldn't have arrived at an answer to that particular conundrum, to that particular quandary. So, yeah, I think you're entirely on the right lines that we've got to struggle with literature. We've got to respect literature. We've got to realize the cultural force of literature. You know, it's not just a, <coughs> excuse me, a cesspool. I can't remember who called it Bataille, wasn't it? A, 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 a sea of evil, an ocean of evil. I mean, yes, truly, it looks at all the sadness and, and nastiness of mankind. That makes a good story. But we've got to remember they are stories, you know, they're, they're meant to be stories pointing beyond themselves. I mean, Wuthering Heights isn't exactly an edifying tale. And it's quite clear by the end of the book. And no one can tell the Brontes how to write a novel. You know, I mean, that's, that foxes me as well. Three spinsters, but the daughters of a father who was a vicar. How did they know all that about lust? Give me, for God's sake, what's going on there? Anyway, you get to the end of Wuthering Heights, and it's perfectly clear both Heathcliff and Cathy are going to hell, and it's perfectly clear they both deserve it. You know, so you know, so all this, oh, Cathy, come back! No, read the book. That's not there at all. Um, no, uh, we've got to be challenged. We've got to be less sensitive. We've got to grow backbones. There's nothing wrong with discussion. I don't mind the younger generation saying that was what you lot did, and we want to revisit those terrains and those territories. We want to look again. I think that's absolutely great. Yeah, I, re I remember the time frame. As an old Hegelian, I remember the time frame when things couldn't be discussed. You wouldn't have discussed uh, a clear black prejudice in a movie. You wouldn't have discussed... Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 you wouldn't have discussed all the great phobias. You wouldn't have discussed anti-Semitism. Not really. And so isn't it great that the young generation wants to go in and say, well, no, you know, we want our understanding of these things. We want our say on these things. But we have to draw the line when some of the slightly more spineless member 
members of that of those particular groups then want to suppress and want to stop the discourse and then want to just erase their opponents, although they'd never been there in the first place. You know, so loads of people go missing from history along with counter arguments and juxtapositions of philosophy. That's when the real danger starts. And as I'd like to remind those young people, that has all the hallmarks of Hitler Youth. Passing back to you, John. Yes, as you, as you say, these things are all so complex. I, you can go back to, uh, uh, there's a woman, uh, Nancy Cunard. She was a British writer. She's an heiress uh, to the Cunard family who have the, not Cunard, but Cunard, the, the, <laughs> the famous uh, family of, of the Cunard uh, ships and uh, so she was fabulously uh, wealthy and, and she was very very active in uh, literary circles and in fact she became the muse of some of the most uh, distinguished writers and artists of, of the 20th century. Uh, Wynnum Lewis, Aldous Huxley, uh, Ezra Pound even uh, and which is interesting and, and uh, Ernest Hemingway, James Joyce, uh, Geez, Langston Hughes, William Carlos Williams. Uh, but yet uh, it was revealed that she was involved with the Indian socialist leader, uh, V.K. Krishna Manon, right? You know, it's like, and then you get the uh, photographer, Man Ray, who's really like uh, just a bizarre dude. Yeah. But uh, she was uh, uh, very much an important figure in that uh, she had uh, financed. Uh, a lot of operations that, that were literary in nature, but, and, and you go, well, geez, she was Ezra Pound's girlfriend. Yeah, but she's also famous for fighting uh, fascism, okay? So it's like, you know, where do we go with this? And what, is, what do these words mean after all? I mean, I, I think that the, you have to look at that Pound's struggle with it it was his struggle with the international banking system that was at the center of, and it was trying to, uh, he was supporter of the forces that were trying to break free of the international banking cartel. And that's what Mussolini represented. But he had another cartel that was behind him that was problematic. And having corporations behind you, that's basically socialism with corporations. That's what fascism is. It's, it's socialist. So it, all this talk about the right wing and the left wing and that the, the right wing is fascism. Well, not, not really, because fascists are socialists. I mean, uh, just ask Mussolini, you know. So there's so much lack of clarity in people's conversations. It's, it's hard to have conversations about many subjects. And so that being said, I think it uh, probably be a good time. Also, I want to add... Uh, if you want to uh, be generous and buy Reverend David or myself a cup of coffee, uh, you can go to paypal.me forward slash D-P-A-R-R-Y 777 for Reverend David or John Barnwell 888 for myself. I put the link below. You can copy it. But if you click on it, again, they've dis disabled the links as far as I can tell from my computer. But you can also access my books through my academia link that's below the posting on both uh, YouTube and on Facebook. But that being said, uh, I'd like to let David get in the last word, which he likes to do, and, and, and consecrate our offering here with a prayer. Well, I'm not sure I've got a last word this week. Um, oh, we're going to talk about sci-fi. Uh, I heard a couple of years ago somebody say um, uh, America doesn't have folklore. I'm sure that's not true, actually, which is why they have sci-fi. Um, I think that was an incredibly interesting remark. I don't think that's pejorative. Um, and certainly if you look at American sci-fi, some of which is brilliant, I'm thinking about Philip K. Dick again, and beautifully written, Um you know, I, that, that's worthy of discussion. It, it's worthy of the, a different type of vocabulary whereby people are talking about the supersensible 
and the paranormal, but using a different vocabulary. Uh, you know, this this aging progressive thinks that's a very positive thing. And that needs to be a show at some time, I think, John. Um, my friends, my dear friend, John, um, all of our viewers and listeners, the holiest of scriptures tells us that in the beginning was the word. And some of those words in human life and in human culture are genuinely and truly sacred. Some of the words of our other halves, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, our husbands, our wives, our families, our friends. But all of them are words of either upliftment or destruction. Let's remember in the days ahead to be uplifting and the yeast in somebody else's bread. Let's make their lives full of poetry and happiness and joy and funny anecdotes and wonderful things that lead them ever more clearly into the kingdom. Our good Lord loved teaching in parables and stories. Let's do that with each other and lead each other along the path to a better place and a better future in the days ahead. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much, my friend, and for everybody that came on board from all around the globe. This has been another What is Truth Exploration.